Well, good morning and welcome to our Bible study this morning. Uh, we're looking at the book of Colossians and before we read, shall we pray? O oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can once again come around your word. We thank you for it. We thank you that you have given us your word, Lord, that is as relevant today as it was when it was written thousands of years ago. We praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, that your word does not change. It is the same yesterday, today and forever as you are. We praise you for that. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us as we read through this and look through this book of the Colossians. We ask that you will guide us and keep us and help us, Lord, to understand more from your word and more of you and come closer to you. Take other thoughts and distractions from us, we pray, Lord, as we come before you. Be with us now, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to read the first chapter of Colossians, um, which gives us an idea of what Paul is talking about in this book. So that's Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learnt it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister 
according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. The message of this book really is the supreme glory and dignity of Christ. He is the head of the church. And as usual, trying to find verses, key verses is very difficult, but I'm looking today at Colossians 2 verses 9 to 10. For in him, that's Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. The purpose of this letter was really to counteract heretical doctrinal teaching and to exhort and teach the believers. Paul was writing this letter from his prison in Rome and Timothy was with him and probably acted as his secretary and wrote to Paul's dictation. As we saw in Colossians 1.1, it starts, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. It's very clear from the introduction that Paul was writing to the church here in Colossae. And he said to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The church in Colossae was not a church set up by Paul himself. He had never been there. It's likely that during Paul's three-year stint in Ephesus, a man from Colossae named Epaphras heard Paul preaching and became a Christian. And he then went back to his hometown of Colossae, taking the message of the gospel with him. And from this church, from this, the church was formed there. In Colossians 1, 7 to 8, as we've just read, just as you learnt it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Epaphras was in Rome with Paul. He will have shared the news of the church in Colossae with Paul and told him that there was a dangerous teaching threatening the church. In Colossians 4.12, near the end, which is where Paul brings it up, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So Paul writes his letter to respond to this situation that's going on and to encourage these believers in their growth towards Christian maturity. And Paul begins this letter by defending the authority of Jesus and warning against spiritual practices which are not of God. He tells the people that Jesus is divine, Jesus is God, because they were starting to say that what many people actually say today, and that he was simply a great prophet, he was a teacher, and there are other paths to connect with God. Well, this dangerous teaching probably comes from the context of the local Jewish and pagan folk belief, which had a tendency to call on angels for help and protection from evil spirits. It's likely that a, sh a shaman-like figure within the church had attracted a following and was presenting himself as something of a Christian spiritual guide. In Colossians 2.18, Paul writes, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. This person in the church was advocating using the senses in their worship rather than their intellect. And he was probably claimed to have superior insight into the spiritual realm and was advising the Colossian Christians 
to practice certain rites, taboos and rituals as a means of protection from evil spirits and for deliverance from afflictions. And we do hear of that today in some churches where these sort of things take place as well. And when Paul hears of the spreading influence of his teaching that devalues Christ and fails to appreciate the new identity of believers in Christ, he writes this letter of warning and encouragement. He doesn't minimise the threat presented by the demonic powers, but emphasises the supremacy of Christ over all the powers, and he asserts the unity of Christians with the exalted Christ, which entails their sharing in his power and his authority. And Paul also takes the opportunity to encourage these believers to press on to maturity in Christ by continuing in their battle against sin, pursuing holiness in Christ and learning to live as distinctly Christian households. And when we were looking at the letter to the Ephesians, we noted that Paul emphasised the church as being the body of Christ. And in this letter, Paul emphasises the headship of Christ over the church. A few verses, verse 18 of chapter 1, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Jesus is the first of everything. He was there at creation. He was the first to um, be born in a miraculous way. He was the first to be raised from the dead. And in Colossians 2.10, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. Just showing us where our authority comes from, where the rule comes from, not people, not man, but from Jesus. And Colossians 2.19, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. And those in the uh, French Revolution would know that severing the head from the body is um, quite dramatic and stops the body growing. Um, the head is needed as part on the body. The head is, guides the body, leads the body. And the chief object and purpose of this letter, therefore, is to draw a faithful portrait of the Lord Jesus in all his dignity, deity and glory. Something that, again, some churches today, some people today, put him down. He's just one of many. He's not God, but he is. The key themes then in this book, Jesus Christ is preeminent over all creation, Lord over all human rules and cosmic powers. You can't really get greater than that. God has worked through Christ to secure redemption and reconciliation for all who put their faith in him. Believers are in Christ and thus participate in a relationship of solidarity with Christ in his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his new life and his fullness. And Christ has defeated the powers of darkness on the cross and Christians share in his power and authority over that realm. Also, Jesus is the fulfilment of Jewish expectation and Christians now share in the heritage of the old covenant people of God through their union with him, bringing all people together. And believers are called to grow in maturity in Christ by getting rid of sinful practices and cultivating Christian virtues. The Bible often talks about the maturity of Christians, Christians becoming mature. And when a, a child becomes a little more mature, they stop just drinking milk and they can have solid food. And then, then it goes on to real meat and solid things. It's slow, but it's something that we go through and we should be looking to become mature in Christ. Looking at analysis of this book then, the epistle is in two main divisions, just like the epistle of Ephesians. There's a doctrinal section followed by a practical section. And so first of all, the doctrinal section. In verses 1 to 8 of chapter 1, there's thanksgiving on behalf of the Colossians. Faith exercised before love manifested. 
in verse 4 of chapter 1. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Their faith is there and love. And the Holy Spirit is only mentioned once in this epistle, but in verse 8, and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Then there's intercession on behalf of the Colossians in verses 9 to 14 of this first chapter. Note the expression, pray for you and asking, in verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So Paul was praying for them, but also asking that God would fulfill them with his knowledge and wisdom. The prayer here has no formal ending, but emerges into a worshipping and enraptured confession of the glory of the Christ of God, verses 13 to 14. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Then there's the supreme dignity, glory and unapproachable preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is viewed from every standpoint in verses 15 of chapter 1 through to the th verse 3 of chapter 2. And this is the very heart of the epistle. In no dictatorial manner, but in a hushed and awed mood, Paul gives a heart-moving and soul-subduing affirmation of the glory of the Lord Jesus. Christ is seen in this section. In deity, he's equal with God, the image of God, the fullness of God, and the firstborn of all creation. A title of dignity. In verse, chapter 1, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And in verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, making it clear that Jesus was not just a man, he was God, fully God and fully man. And Christ is seen in creation. He's the creator of the universe and the reason for all creation. Verse 16, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He's seen in providence. He's the sustainer of the universe. He who by one creative act formed the universe and by continuous activity sustains it. Verse 17, and he is before all things and in him all things hold together. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that we worship. He's seen in the church. In Ephesians, we see what the body is to the head. In Colossians, what the head is to the body. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in everything, he might have preeminence or be preeminent. Jesus is seen in redemption. He's the only redeemer and his redemption has wide extent. And we've read verses 20 to 23. We see, and through, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, and it goes on. But he's also seen in the gospel mystery, and the mystery is Christ in you. And Paul writes in verses 24 to 29, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ, in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister, according to the stewardship from God, that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. And then we move on to the second section, the practical section. Paul likes to have the doctrinal, but then the practical. There are warnings against error and heresy in chapter 2. There are enticing words in verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. That's the difficulty. People come in and they sound plausible, but they're not. They are not from the Word of God. There's a vain philosophy in verse 8 of chapter 2. Paul says, see to it that no one takes you captive 
by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. There's warning against ritualism in verses 16 to 17 of chapter 2. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And we've already mentioned there's warnings against angel worship. In verse 18 of chapter 2, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And also a warning against empty and vain self-humbling and denial. In verses 20 to 23, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Then there is a union with Christ and its results which come from chapter 3 verse 1 to 4 verse 6 and as joined to our risen Lord there must be a heavenly mindedness. Set your minds on things that are above not on things that are on earth Paul says in verse 2 of chapter 3. There's holy living in home service and all walks of life. And um, he says in chapters 3 and 4, wives submit to husbands, husband loves wives, children obey parents, parents don't provoke children, servants, slaves, workers obey masters, masters treat workers justly and fairly. There's that holy living, that's being with one another and not taking advantage of anyone. And then finally, there are the greetings to the Colossians. There's a rich collection of Christian workers in this passage. It's worth noting the peculiarities of each. With Paul in Rome, there was Tychicus, who was bringing the letter. He was described as a brother, a faithful minister and fellow servant, and an encourager. That would be a nice thing for someone to say about us, wouldn't it? That we are an encourager. Then there was Onesimus. He was faithful, a faithful and beloved brother. He was one of them. And if you read Philemon, the one chapter book, letter that Paul wrote, you'll, for more information you'll find that Philemon, that um, Onesimus was a slave that had run away, but had become a Christian and was now coming back. Aristarchus is mentioned and he was a fellow prisoner. Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, and they were told if he visits Colossae, he should be welcomed. And this is the Mark who on the first missionary journey left Paul and Barnabas and Paul was not very pleased about that and that caused the, I say bust up, I don't really mean bust up, between um, Mark, uh, Paul and Barnabas that they went their separate ways, Barnabas taking Mark and Paul taking Silas on the second missionary journey. But Mark was there, the writer of the gospel, he was there with Jesus and he should be welcomed. Then there was someone called Jesus, who was also known as Justus, and he was the last of the Jewish men with Paul. The rest had all abandoned him. Epaphras, a Colossian, a prayer warrior for the church he's described as, a hard worker for the Colossian church, and the churches in Laodicea and Hierapolis. And then there was Luke, a doctor, the writer of Luke's Gospel and the book of Acts and Demas, we're not told much about him. They were the people with Paul in Rome. Not all of them were prisoners. They could come and go, they were with him. Aristarchus is the only one that's described as a fellow prisoner. But in Colossae, there was Nympha, who hosts the church in her house, and Archippus, who was a minister of the Lord. Great number of people there with fantastic personalities that we could learn from and that Paul just lists them. He has to list them. And it's one way we find out exactly 
who was where and what was who was taking information on. But if you think about it, that Epaphras was the one who probably started this church in Colossae, was now in Rome and was coming back to the people. A great worker for them, a prayer warrior for the church, something that perhaps we ought to be as well, a prayer warrior. It doesn't mean we have to go out preaching, but it means that we can pray for the church. So that's the um, church, uh, the, the letter to the Colossians, and we'll now look and see how the, the film puts it. Paul's letter to the Colossians. It was written during one of Paul the Apostle's many imprisonments for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And the letter is addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he didn't start. This church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. And Epaphras had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall, but he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting them to turn away from Jesus. And so Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address the issues that Epaphras had raised and then to challenge them to a greater devotion to Jesus. The letter's design and flow of thought are pretty easy to follow. The opening movement focuses on Jesus as the exalted Messiah. Paul then goes on to show how his suffering in prison is for the exalted Jesus. And then he addresses the pressures tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. After this, he explores the new way of life that Jesus' resurrection opened up for them. So the letter opens with two prayers. Paul first thanks God that he learned from Epaphras that the Colossians have been totally faithful to Jesus, showing love for God and their neighbors, all because of the hope they have in the new creation that Jesus has in store. And so he moves on to pray that they would grow in their wisdom and understanding about Jesus. And then Paul has placed a poem here to help the Colossians and us do exactly that. It's the centerpiece of chapter one, a poem all about the crucified and exalted Messiah. It has two parallel stanzas, and it's crammed with language and imagery from the books of Genesis and Exodus, from the Psalms and the Proverbs. The first stanza explores how Jesus is the true image of God. In him, the full character and purpose of God is embodied in a human. He's the firstborn, an Old Testament phrase about Jesus' royal status over all creation. He shares in the very identity of the one true creator God. And by him, all reality, all powers and authorities, spiritual and human, have been created. It's in Jesus the Messiah that we discover the very author and king of creation. And so in the second stanza, we discover he's also the one bringing about a new creation. He's the head of a new body, which refers to Jesus' people, who are the new humanity, of which his own resurrection existence is a prototype. In him, God's glorious temple presence dwells, and so it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that God has reconciled himself to humanity, to all spiritual powers, to all of creation. It's a remarkable poem, and Paul will keep referring back to it as he goes on in the letter. So he first shows how the truth of this poem transforms his own experience of suffering in prison. He's being punished for announcing to the Greek and the Roman world that Jesus is the resurrected Lord and King of all. And so his suffering, he thinks, is not a sign of defeat. It's actually his way of participating in Jesus' own suffering done as an act of love. And so his hardships are actually a cause for joy. He's imprisoned for the surprising news that Israel's resurrected Messiah is creating a new multi-ethnic family. And more, just as the divine glory dwelt in Jesus, so Jesus dwells in and among his international family. Or as Paul says, the Messiah is in you all, the hope of glory. Paul then addresses the cultural pressures that are tempting the Colossians to turn away from Jesus. They were confronted by a combination of mystical polytheism along with a pressure to observe the laws of the Torah. 
So all these new Christians, they had grown up worshiping the various Greek and Roman gods who governed different arenas of human life. And many simply included Jesus as one more deity that they could worship. There was also great pressure from the Jewish Christian community for these non-Jews to complete their commitment to the Messiah by following all of the laws found in the Torah. Specifically, he mentions eating a kosher diet, observing sacred days, and circumcision. It's very similar to the problem he addressed in the letter to the Galatians. For Paul, to give in to either of these temptations is compromise. It's a failure to grasp who Jesus really is and what he did on their behalf. The Colossians used to live in fear of spiritual powers and elemental spirits, as Paul calls them. But Jesus triumphed over these through his death and resurrection. He freed the Colossians from any obligation to them. In the same way, Jesus fulfilled on our behalf all of the laws of the Torah, which never had the power to transform the selfish human heart anyway. And so what Jesus did in his life and death and resurrection, it lacks nothing. It doesn't need to be supplemented by following the laws. He is the reality to which all of the laws of the Torah were pointing anyway. Instead of the laws, followers of Jesus have the power of his resurrection to change them, which is what he goes on to explore. Following Jesus means joining his new humanity because their lives have now been joined to the risen Jesus' life. And this is why Paul challenges the Colossians to set their minds on things above where the Messiah is seated or rules at God's right hand. Now, Paul doesn't mean here, think about how you'll one day leave earth and go to heaven. Rather, the heavens are the transcendent place from which Jesus rules now over all of creation. And from there, he will one day return here to transform all things. Or as Paul says, when the Messiah who is your life is revealed, you too will be revealed with him in glory. So Paul challenges them to live in the present as the kinds of new humans they will one day become. He uses the image of their old humanity, characterized by distorted sexuality and destructive speech. For Christians, that humanity died with Jesus and has been replaced by his own new humanity, which is characterized by mercy and generosity, by forgiveness and love. And this humanity, it transcends the ethnic and social boundary lines of our world to create, in Paul's words, a people where there is no one Greek or Jewish, circumcised or uncircumcised, slave or free, but the Messiah is all and is in all people. Paul then gets really practical and he shows the Colossians what this new humanity might look like in a first century Roman household, which was a highly authoritarian institution where the male patriarch held the power of life and death over his wife and children and slaves. Not so in a Christian household. Here, the risen Jesus is the true Lord. And so in the Lord, the wife allows her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is subject to Jesus by loving his wife and placing her well-being above his own. In a home where Jesus is Lord, children are not objects, but are called to maturity and to respect. And parents are to raise their children with patience and understanding. Christians who are slaves are to honor their human masters precisely because they're not the real master. Jesus is. And Christians who have slaves are to understand that this slave is not their property, but rather a fellow member of Jesus's body to be honored and embraced in love. Paul's walking a very fine line here. He is reshaping the most basic Roman institution around Jesus who rules by his self-giving love. And so while he doesn't abolish the household structure outright, the exalted Messiah demands that it be transformed almost beyond the point of recognition for any Roman living in Colossae. You can see this most clearly in the letter's conclusion. After a request for prayer, Paul applies these instructions about Christian slaves and masters. And we discover that Tychicus is the one carrying and reading this letter to the Colossians. And he's accompanied by a certain Onesimus, who was a former slave to a Colossian Christian named Philemon. And we discover from another letter addressed to Philemon that Onesimus had escaped from his master. It was a crime worthy of imprisonment. But Paul asks the whole church to greet Onesimus as a faithful and beloved brother in the Lord. And then in the letter to Philemon, Paul says that he should receive Onesimus no longer as a slave, but as a brother. Talk about ending the letter with a punch. So in the letter to the Colossians, 
Paul is inviting us to see that no part of human existence remains untouched by the loving and liberating rule of the risen Jesus. Our suffering, our temptation to compromise, our moral character, the power dynamics in our homes, all of it must be re-examined and transformed. We are invited to live in the present as if the new creation really arrived when Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what the letter to the Colossians is all about.